Hi, everyone. Welcome to Heron Project Live. I am your host, Kevin Michael Azik. Thank you all for tuning in tonight. We have an amazing show lined up for you. Lined up for you. A couple of quick Heron Project announcements. Today is July 1st, and it marks the beginning of our annual empowerment appeal. This year's theme is Seeds of Hope. There's a saying that, <clears throat> excuse me, if you plant a seed you have faith in tomorrow. If you plant a seed on behalf of someone else, <coughs> excuse me. If you plant a seed on behalf of someone else, you believe in them. So this year we're aiming to raise four hundred thousand. Last year we far exceeded that goal. Um, it is a month long initiative. There's a couple other ways that you can get involved. There's our Seeds of Hope virtual race. Um, that is um, where you sign up. You run with us and you commit to running a certain amount of miles and it doesn't have i shouldn't mention too it doesn't have to be just running it could be biking it could be walking um you can commit to as little or as many miles as you want and we're going to tally those miles up and hopefully we will stretch all the way across the country from Tiverton, rhode island all the way to seattle washington also recently just added we have a kids version of the seeds of hope race where kids can get involved um, help us raise awareness and funds for Heron Project. All of that is available on our website, heronproject.org, and also on our social media channels. So our first guest tonight is Caleb Daniloff. He is a Heron Project ambassador and also an author of Running Ransom Road. He has been a great advocate for Heron Project, and I'm excited to have him. I'm going to bring him in. <clears throat> Hi, Caleb. Hey, Kevin, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. Did you get out the kind of stage fright and shake out the nerves? I did, and I wiped down my forehead. You gave me a complex. I put the hat on. I put the cover up on my temple. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Although I know Pam would have given me a lot of grief if I didn't have uh, some, some Heron Project gear on. Because it's, you yeah, know, it's Pam. Nice. It's, yeah. It's pandatory. Pandatory. I like that. Yeah, we that's should, right. We should copyright that. It's copywritten. So you've been with Heron Project a while, kind of stretching back to the 2013 Boston Marathon. Can you kind of just tell us how you got involved with Heron Project and kind of the story behind it? Sure. Um, well, it was totally one of those, like, uh, you know, fateful life moments. Um, I was uh, writing for Runner's World at the time, and it was actually the 2014 uh, Boston Marathon. This was the year after the bombings. And actually, originally, um, I had been assigned a piece to write about Frank Shorter, who was going to run the Boston Marathon. And, you know, he's an Olympic gold medalist, and he was the um, he was at the Munich Olympics when there was that, you know, the terrorist act um, there uh, at the Olympics. And so he was gonna he was gonna run it, and I was gonna do a story on him. And then he pulled out uh, from injury, and uh, you know a couple of weeks later, I got I was told uh, you know you know to write a story about Chris Heron, um, who was running also running the, the Boston Marathon. I'd never heard of him. Um, you know, of course, I watched the documentary right away. I read his book. Uh, you know, was was blown away. Um, and so that's how I first sort of connected with Chris. And then, you know, obviously I knew he was running the marathon and a good friend of mine, uh, Pam Rickard, um, you know, I was going to meet her actually for the first time at the Boston Marathon. And I told her all about Chris and um, she was likewise sort of, uh, um, you know, very impressed by him. And um, so we all met, um, you know, at the expo and uh, later in Hopkinton where and you were there as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I do, I, I remember you guys were all, all in black on a, you know, 78 degree day, full sun. Um, you know, <laughs> you were there, you were there ready to throw down. Um, and you were thrown down seven, eight, nine, ten hours later on the course. Um, <laughs> but, but anyway, so that's how I first sort of got connected and, and, um, you know, I just sort of, you know, in a way, I guess sort of fell in love with the, you know, the idea of Heron Project and, you know, the community that was starting to build. And then Pam got involved and started building the, uh, um, you know, the running program, which, you know, started with just, you know, Pamela Hogue, who was, you know, sort of you guys' first runner. Um, 
and uh, you know it's really it's really grown and it's just been sort of a pleasure to you know to watch it watch it build and grow and expand uh, over the years um, and uh, yeah, so that's that's sort of the backstory. Does Pam have you on retainer because you've mentioned her four times already? I'm yeah, I get, I get a check. Like I get a check. I get a check every time. My Venmo goes off every time. Totally. I mention every time Pam. you mention her name, you get a you get a Venmo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, when you wrote that story, and I know you know you being a person in recovery, can you kind of talk about just writing that story and um, how it kind <clears> of <throat> um, related to your recovery and just um, what went into that? Um, sure. I mean, it was, uh, you know, obviously, um, you know, knowing that, that Chris was in recovery and knowing his story um, res resonated with me. Um, I'd been sober, I think at that time, 11 or 12 years. Um, you know, I was uh, I had a, um, a history of alcoholism and drug abuse. And, uh, you know, so I sort of, you know, I really I connected with him on that level. And so it was, you know, we just had a really good conversation. Um, obviously, his his path was a bit different. But I remember him saying uh, uh, something, you know, at one point I was talking, well, you know, I was I was just an alcoholic. And, and he just said, you know, it's a you know, same different journey, same cage. Um, you know, so I think that's, you know, that that really resonated. Um, you know, so it was just, uh, it was an opportunity, getting involved with the Heron Project was really sort of an opportunity for me to um, have have more of a platform. I mean, I did write a lot about it. I wrote a book about my experience. Um, so it, it allowed, it gave me sort of a platform, especially when the ambassador program started. Um, and not only a platform, but a toolbox to, you know, to help people. I mean, people would reach out to me uh, fairly regularly and, you know, and I would sort of counsel them as best I knew how. I'd usually suggest they, you know, check out an AA meeting and that sort of thing. But, you know, having sort of Heron Project behind us, um, you know, it just, it make you know, it, we're able to get people on the right path for them more quickly. Um, so it's it's really become sort of a powerful uh, tool for me and in, in my advocacy for for sobriety and recovery. And I mean, you have been um, an unbelievable asset for us. You've connected us with so many different people, and I know um, we've been able to assist you know people that are close to you. And that's and, you know that's kind of how you know this thing works. You know, we're a family. Albeit Absolutely. we've grown into a very big family, but we've kind of, um, you know, we're con connected. Can you kind of talk about just the family aspect of Heron Project and what that means to you? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I mean, I sometimes think of that old hair club for men, um, you know, I'm not just, a, well, in this case, it'd be different, but, um, you know, I mean, I'm not just an ambassador, but I'm also a client in a way. Um, I mean, Heron Project, you know, unfortunately, my, my, uh, my daughter, struggled with uh, substance use disorder and uh, was on a bad road for, for a while. And, you know, Heron Project was able to assist her along the way. Um, and, and I guess I'll never forget, um, there was one time that, you know, that you guys had helped her get into Gosnold and, uh, um, you know, she was resistant. And after a couple of days, she uh, tried to check herself out. And uh, I remember being in touch with you and you jumped in the car and drove over to Gosnold and tried to, and intercepted her and convinced her to, you know, to stay a little longer. Um, and to me, that just speaks volumes about sort of what kind of organization Heron Project is. I mean, where you have the executive director, you know, directly trying to intervene, you know, it just shows the passion and the commitment. And like you said, you know, sort of that family aspect, um, you know, and, uh, you know, my daughter did have, you know, it's it's not a straight line ever. Um, she did have some setbacks, and it took her a little while to, to, uh, you know, get on a get on a good road. Um, but I'm I'm happy to say that she is uh, she's now um, uh, I think she's going on five months sober, and in fact was uh, recently asked uh, to manage her sober house up in Portland. Oh, um, yeah, so she's it's like it. she is crushing it. It's like you know miracles do happen. Um, I mean, two years ago. You know, we would never have dreamed of, of this kind of, you know, turn that her life has taken. And, and you know, there's there's sort of, you know, we saw her over Father's Day and there's a sort of a contentment and a, and I'd say maybe a, a satisfaction that she's sort of embracing life and and life's challenges and, uh, you know, you know, is, is living a 
sort of vibrant life and recovery, you know, and it's just, uh, you know, it, it has a miraculous feeling to it. And, and Heron Project was definitely part of helping her, uh, helping her out. So I thank you. It's one of the most beautiful things to witness when you can watch the light bulb, you know, the, kind of that proverbial light bulb go off and you can see someone, you know, live a happy, healthy life to be of service to others, to be able to, you know, want to give back, to be able to be put in a position where, you know, they're trusted. Um, it's one of the most beautiful things to witness. And, you know, for me personally, that's kind of what keeps me going because, you know, we deal with failure a lot. You know, we yeah. try to help people and it's not always successful and, you know, bad things happen and people die, but it's those success stories that you can hold on to and be, have the privilege to be a part of that kind of really keep you going. Yeah. I mean, it's still, it's still, you know, one day at a time for, for her and for us. Um, but, uh, but you're right. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, seeing her, you know, thriving um, is, uh, you know, is, is greatly satisfying. And, you know, I'm just, I'm so happy for her, um, you know, that she is, uh, you know, moving forward in a, in a real positive way. So now too, you've also kind of taken your love of writing and kind of turned that into a tool to help families. Can you talk a little bit about that and your work with um, Learn to Cope as well? Yep. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when my, my daughter was in, uh, you know, during, during the bad times, we, um, it took us a while to get to this place, but we did finally get to, to Learn to Cope support group, which, um, you know, if you're in the Massachusetts area and you're struggling with, uh, with a loved one, I cannot um, uh, emphasize enough what a difference this group made for us in terms of getting educated and, and realizing, um, you know, that what we thought were just being sort of parental, um, you know, being trying to be good parents and supportive parents was actually ending up enabling her. And um, so, so we've been involved with Learn to Cope going on two plus years. Um, we recently became facilitators. And um, last February, I started a uh, writing group for um, parents of loved ones because, you know, some parents feel like they can't speak as well in meetings, um, or they've always sort of processed um, their pain on the page. And uh, so, you know, every every couple of weeks, you know, we get together now on Zoom, obviously, and, uh, you know, sort of eight or nine of us. And sometimes Joanne Peterson, she's a member of the, she's the founder of Learn to Cope. Um, she will sometimes join us. Um, and, you know, people just write about their, their experiences. And it's, you know, it's been pretty beautiful to watch. And um, it's been, you know, people, People in that group say that they, you know, they look forward to the writing workshop as much as they do to the learn to cope meeting. So it's, it's having a therapeutic effect. And, uh, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a big advocate of, of sort of sharing our stories um, as a way to destigmatize. And, uh, you know, they say that sunlight is the best disinfectant. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm a huge believer in, in, you know, sharing, sharing our stories where we can and when it's safe. Amen to that. Kayla, bye. I'm truly grateful, and I know all of us at Heron Project and Chris are grateful for your support and your dedication to our organizations, and I want to thank you for coming on tonight. You are a total rock star, and I think um, by my tally, Pam owes you for about seven mentions, <laughs> so make sure she doesn't try to jip you. Yeah, I got to watch her. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Well, Caleb, thank you, and enjoy the rest of your night. All right. Thanks for having me, Kevin. All right, brother. All right. All right um, next up is um, the Heron Project Live first. We have a actual pre-recorded um, segment. Um, this segment is with Carlene Matthews. She's out in Oregon. Um, she is a person in long-term recovery from alcoholism and also in eating disorder. And she has reached the pinnacle in fitness. She's a three-time participant in the CrossFit Games. Um, so it was really nice to be able to talk to her. And she had such an incredible story. So give me one second. I am going to bring that up.
Hi, Colleen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Excited to have you um, all the way from Oregon. And um, so I know you got into recovery in October 2010. Can you kind of tell us a little bit how you got into recovery and what your life was like that led you to seek help and a life of recovery? Yeah. Um, so, you know, growing up, I, uh, I had um, a pretty normal uh life, family home. Um, my parents divorced when I was young. Um, but other than that, you know, um, my parents were very supportive. I played sports growing up. Um, I was very involved in all of uh, like different um, athletics and uh, extracurricular activities, stuff like that. Um, but uh, it, I kind of found I found alcohol and drugs um, when I was about <clears throat> eighth grade, and uh, I just continued to kind of experiment with um, drugs and alcohol through high school. Um, I was more of that like party girl. Um, I was an athlete, and um, I hung around the people that like partying on the weekends, and um, I found that I didn't have to, like, have that, you know, social anxiety, and um, I could kind of change who I was, and people liked me when I was drinking, um, and so that really, like, elevated my drinking. Um, so out of high school, um, through college, continued to drink, but I was always still, um, I played college softball. I was very involved in um, my softball, and um, I did great in school, but on the weekends, I liked to party. And, um, and so after college, um, I really struggled with trying to um, figure out who I was. So like who I was outside of a softball athlete or um, a uh, college athlete. Um, and when with that kind of started, um, I developed an eating disorder. Um, I started getting attention for uh, the way I looked and for losing weight. And um, I liked that attention, and I didn't have the attention for, um, you know, being an athlete anymore. And uh, so my kind of mental shift went over towards um, how could I get more attention for, um, you know, losing weight or looking the best. And, um, and so with the eating disorder became... Uh, or brought on more drugs for me. Um, so uh, just like more like party drugs um, and things to keep me like energized. Um, it also brought on more drinking because when I drank, I didn't care and uh, I could kind of eat whatever I wanted. Um, so uh, outside of after um, college, developed an eating disorder, then the drinking got worse. Um, but, you know, kind of finally was able to uh, put into kind of play that um, I had some sort of problem, that I, I wasn't happy. Um, my parents were worried. Uh, my family was worried. And so I was able to admit that I had an eating disorder and I accepted like help for that. So I went into treatment for an eating disorder and then uh, that's when the drinking and using got even worse because I needed another coping skill. Um, so finished treatment um, for the eating disorder and my drinking and drug use got uh, pretty out of control. Um, I was still really like, I was still pretty functional. Um, 
Um, I was able to keep jobs. Um, I was able to uh, function uh, no normally, except that on weekends, I went out and partied. And it was more of me making poor decisions um, that didn't feel right for me. Um, and so I was doing like regular therapy and um, regularly, regularly going in there saying like, yeah, I went out this weekend and I did this, this, and this. And, you know, I just feel really shitty about it. Um, but it kind of, you know, it's just like that's just a spiral. Um, I'd make a poor decision one weekend and say like, I'm not. going to do that again and I go to therapy on Monday and I'm not going to do that again and then the weekend rolled around and sure enough I did it again um and so you know I don't really know what happened and what uh finally made me like say enough is enough um I happened to go out I had kind of like a long bender of a weekend um, I, I got drunk, um, was using drugs, was out partying, happened to like make a comment to a friend of mine that like, it was just being a bad friend. Like I was like, ratting her out for things that she was doing with her boyfriend. And I was, you know, like just, you know, like wasn't, wasn't. being me true like true me like I found that when I drank I was mean and um and so I I happened to go to therapy that next Monday and um you know had said to my therapist like this is just it like I'm just gonna try and not drink for 30 days like I'm gonna prove to her that it wasn't the alcohol <laughs> that wasn't the problem it was actually her <laughs> And, um, you know, and I, and I just, I said, I'm going to prove that I can not drink for 30 days and that I don't have a problem with this. This is not a problem for me. And so, uh, I, that was the day I got sober, um, and I haven't drank since. And so, uh, you know, what started out for me is just a, I'm going to just try and not, I'm just not going to do this for 30 days. Um turned into 90 days, turned into a year. And, you know, I never, in that first full year, I never, ever said I'm an alcoholic. Um, that, that wasn't, like, I didn't, I didn't know that then. You know, I just, well, I'm just not drinking right now, and I've done this before. I mean, I did it. In, I did it in college all the time. In season, we don't drink. Out of season, we can do whatever we want. When did you go to college? Um, I went to Concordia University uh, for two years. I also went to St. Martin's University for two years. Um, so both locally here. I've always wanted to try to bat against the uh, a softball. Athletes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, my shoulder's no good anymore. But um, you, did you pitch? Yeah, I pitched. Nice. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, I, in my head, I'd like hit it out of the park, but I'd probably. It's different for sure. It is. Yeah. So what kind of kind of made you decide that, or publicly admit that you were an alcoholic? Um. You know, I did a lot of work in um, therapy to uh, to start to realize that um, I liked the person that I was when I wasn't drinking, and I also um, just the I don't I don't really know. There was no like one turning point for me. I think it was just a lot of work, um, a lot of. Uh, self-awareness that um, made me realize that it okay it wasn't it wasn't just me it was um, it was 
it was the alcohol that was making me the person that I didn't want to be. And like, I was finding that I, I could be someone that, that I like respected and valued and I could be like really who I was, um, without the alcohol and the alcohol was what was like causing me like this internal like battle of who am I? Am I the party girl? Am I, who do you, oh, who do you want me to be? You know, like I started to learn that like, no, this is who I am and this is what I like to do. And, um, and I'm okay with this person that I am. Um, so it was, I mean, there was really no like one thing for me. It was a lot of just like work of really digging in deep to figure out like who I, who is Carlene? And, um, and I had never gone there. I had never done that work. I had never, uh, like I said, it was always for me, I always had a mask on. So if it was the eating disorder, if it was the drinking, it was always, who, what do, who do I think you want me to be? And, and that was who I would be. If I, if I was with the party, like friends that like to party, I was party girl. And that's, you know, and that's what I, and they liked it at first <laughs> until, until I actually got, you know, until they realized what happened. Okay. Um, so, you know, it's funny, like today I, I joke about it. I'm like, you don't, like, you don't want me to drink. Like, you don't want to see the person that I become when I drink. No. And and so it was just time for me. It was time um, of realizing that uh, I didn't have to drink. Um, and I didn't have to conform to be who I thought that what, who I thought they wanted me to be. You know, I learned that I could be whoever I wanted to be. And, um. And if people liked me, then, then they liked me. And if they didn't, then that, then they didn't have to hang out with me. And I didn't have to, you know, conform to anything I wasn't. And uh, that was really freeing for me once I found that out. And Huge relief, isn't it? Yeah. And it was, you know, and, and that just, like, and then it just started piling on. You know, it just started, like, then I got more time and, like, it was, like, yeah, like I, I don't want this stuff. Like I don't, I don't know. So. So you took that despair, that desperation, and kind of, you know, for lack of a better, you reinvented yourself and you turned that into fitness. And I mean, you pretty much got yourself to the pinnacle of fitness, being in the CrossFit Games. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that journey. So how you kind of transitioned into CrossFit and that journey that you've been on? Yeah, so I got sober in October and I found CrossFit in the um, very end of December of 2010. Um, so I found CrossFit very early on in my sobriety. Um, and it was, for me, it was somewhere that I, when I walked in the door, um, nobody asked me about my past. Nobody asked me, um, you know, what I had done previously. Nobody really cared. Um, all they cared about was that I came in and gave a hundred percent of what I had that day. And, um, you know, that I was consistent. And so, for me, it was, that was another thing that really, really helped me find who I was and be okay with, um, almost, you know, like reinventing myself. Uh, it was, I didn't have to try and be somebody I wasn't. I got to just be, um, me and, and really like figure out who me was and who I wanted to be and who, um, and really who I could be. And so, um, you know, learning from my experiences in CrossFit and just continually growing in CrossFit, I was able to like see what I was capable of and continued like every, like every day was, you know, when you're fresh, like new and fresh in CrossFit, you just like, 
every day is like a new PR and like, oh, like I can do this and I can do this. And, um, and so, you know, that was like, wow, like I can do this stuff. And, um, and I fit in here and, and people don't care what I did a month ago or two months ago. And, um, you know, I remember like early on, uh, I started to become like friends with some of the other athletes at the gym. And, um, they were like, Oh, we're going to like, we're going to go out this weekend. Like, you want to go? And I'm like, no, I'm good. Like I don't drink. They're like, Oh, that's cool. Like I was like, Oh, okay. Cause like, you don't get that reaction a lot of times. A lot of no. times. And they just completely respected it. And they're like, Oh, that's cool. Like, no big deal. And, you know, early on, I didn't go out a lot because it just, I couldn't, you know. Um, but I eventually got to the place where I'm like, all right, I can go to the the, the potlucks on the weekend and uh, hang out and other people can be drinking around me and, and it doesn't affect me. Um, but, you know, when I was early on, like, I didn't do that and they didn't judge me for doing that. Um, for not doing that and they didn't not they didn't stop being my friend because I didn't I just didn't go out with them on the weekend um and so that was like a big eye-opener for me um was it was it was just like oh I, I can do this thing you know I can do this like they respect me for for being me and um you know they don't like I don't know. It was, it was really cool. Uh, so yeah, I, I started getting really into CrossFit and, you know, again, just realized what my potential was. And I think that it still took like somebody making me aware of like, Hey, like you have potential. Um, who was that person for you? Uh, who was that person? Um, so there's one of our, uh, one at the, uh, gym that I was at was, um, a, an athlete who was on the, uh, the team. So for like the regionals and stuff, um, he was on the team and he had said, you know, you're going to be on our team this year. And I was like, eh, no, like, no big deal. He was like, no, like, yeah, you're going to be on our team. And. And I was still, like, learning what CrossFit was. You know, I I didn't know. I just started, like, RXing things. And, um, and so that was, like, the first time I really uh, started to believe in myself and started to wonder, like, huh, maybe I, maybe I could do this thing. Um, the other thing that happened was I went to a competition here locally. And um, I had no expectations for it. I didn't know. I still didn't know what I was doing. Um, and I got into the last in the final heat. And in the final heat, I like, did really well. And I, at that time, Cheryl Brost was the huge games athlete. Like she was the big athlete in our area. And I ended up beating her by like one or two seconds in, in the final. Um, it didn't like put me on the podium or anything. Cause I think I like barely squeaked into the final heat. Um, but I had beat her and my judge looked at me and she was like, you just beat Cheryl. And I was like, what was the record? I have no idea. I can't remember. <laughs> um, but she was like, you know, you just beat Cheryl. Like, this is a really big deal. You beat Cheryl. And I was like, oh, huh, okay, that's cool. Um, and, then, and so when I walked away from that, I was like, oh, I think I can do, like, I think I can do this. Um, so that was a big turning point. And that, I walked away from that weekend. Like, I remember calling my dad on my way home and being like, I want to do this. Like, this is what I'm going to do now. No more running marathons. No more running 5Ks. That doesn't interest me anymore. I'm going to compete. And, um, yeah, I literally, like, remember talking, having that conversation with my dad on the way home. So, One of the things I love about 
CrossFit and that I miss is really that community aspect. And I think for those of us in recovery, that's a big piece of the attraction with CrossFit is that, you know, you had mentioned and talked about it, that it's a community, they're accepting, they just love you for who you are. And then there's also this sense of kind of shared struggle because um, everyone comes in, they do the same workout, you know, you might scale it, you might be doing a little less weight, but in essence, you're all doing the exact same movements, the exact same exercises for that day. So I think that, uh, you know, CrossFit and recovery kind of, to me, go hand in hand. Yeah, it's, it's really funny, um, all the similarities between like CrossFit and recovery. And um, I talk about it a lot to like my recovery athletes that like people in recovery and addicts make the best CrossFitters because we like, we know how to suffer and we appreciate, like, like you said, we appreciate that community. We, um, we love like that shared suffering. And, um, and on top of that, like, we're going to dive head first into it. And like, and that's going to be like everything that we do. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, there's so many um, parallels between like 12 steps and CrossFit that like, there'll be things that like I'll hear in like a 12 step meeting and I'll be like, yeah, that's, that's like, that's, that's my mentality in CrossFit. And so I have to like, be careful about how much like you know I'll share in a 12 step meeting about like all I want to talk about is like well this relates to me because of CrossFit you know but it's like oh we'll keep them separate but I think the other thing with CrossFit too is is like days you just don't want to show up and do it but then when you go and do it you feel better and I think in recovery especially early in recovery it's challenging you don't necessarily feel like you want to do it but when you get through that day when you get through that moment when you get through that difficult time it's always so much better on the other side yep it's i mean it's it's so there's the it's so parallel you know like it's um it's just it's to me it i don't understand why um I never realized it before, uh, but yeah, it's exactly. I mean, there's. I posted the other day, just yesterday or Sunday, that like I did not want to get up this morning and work out. Like I was not motivated. It was not about motivation. There's days. There's lots of days that I'm not motivated, but this is the routine that I've built for myself, and this is the commitment that I've made to myself um, to get. A workout in and that's just what I do and so and that's 100% my life now it's like I just don't drink like I don't I don't have the desire anymore and it doesn't mean that I'm like super motivated to get to a meeting or work the steps or anything like that but I just don't drink for today yeah. and and that's just what I do um so you know when you know, now when people ask me like, hey, do you want to drink or whatever, if I'm somewhere, I'm like, no. And it doesn't trigger me anymore because I just don't do it. It's just what I, I just don't drink. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's the same thing with, with exercise or crosses. I just do this every day. That's just what I do. I don't have to necessarily want to, but I, I just take the next right step. Right. What's so. your favorite CrossFit workout? Um, don't even say like the filthy fifty. No, I don't really know. Um, it's hard right now. Like fight gone bad. No, no. You know, I have like it, you know, I go through phases. So. Um, no training for the games. I might have certain like movements or like a style of workout that I like more. And then, you know, when I'm not, when I'm off season, I might have a style of workout that I like more right now. I'm in the, uh, 
in the style of workout that's uh, the pregnancy workout. So, um, you know, it's, it's hard because uh, it's a whole different world, right? Um, and I just have to adapt. And so what might have been a favorite workout of mine three months ago is now like, well, I can't fucking do it anymore. <laughs> I can imagine burpees and pregnancy on a good mix. Uh, I, luckily, I still have those barely. I just lost my push ups today, but. Um, how, how long are you? I'm seven months. So you're almost there? Getting there, yeah. So August, baby, is what they're predicting? Sep early September. Early September. That's when my mm -hmm. daughter was born, September. Nice. Yeah. Do you, know, you have a boy or a girl? Girl. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that'll be good. Um, you know, it's a whole nother world now. Like it's a it's a whole nother uh, motivation for me on the exercise side and also the sobriety side. I mean, I can't imagine um, what my life would be like if I, you know, had still been. It, my life would be completely different if I was drinking and, um, you know, and it's going to be a whole nother test too of like, I know a lot of people are like, yeah, you're going to wish you drank when you, once you have the baby, you know, but you know, that's just not how my life is. And that's just, I don't yeah, know. I don't buy that either. It, it is a different, unique set of challenges, but we're equipped to, to deal with change to deal with, you know, life being kind of hectic. Yeah. You know, we have the perfect skill set for parenting. Dude. Right. So when we can take that and pour it into our kids, it's it's a win-win. And that's what I like to, like, think that, you know, I have the upper hand. Like, I have the upper hand. Like, I, I've developed coping skills. <laughs> like, people who drink don't have coping skills. Well, they do. It's drinking. Yeah. So. Wait till she gets to about nine years old. My daughter's almost nine. You'll start feeling like you have the upper hand. <laughs> That's awesome. She is. I mean, it, it's amazing, but she is definitely a strong-willed woman. Um, That's great. And her mom is like that, too. So, yeah. Is great. it your first child? Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Big stuff. Yep. Well, thank you so much for for joining us tonight. We appreciate it. And Absolutely. Thank you for all you do for the recovery community. Thank you. Uh, I know you help a lot of people through your gym at CrossFit St. Helens. Um, yeah, we have a recovery program um, that I have a, an assistant coach um, that helps me with that. And we offer, you know, free, free CrossFit to anyone who's uh, in recovery. So awesome. it's, a, it's a looking a little different right now because we can't have before the um, pandemic, we were having 25 people in a class and now we've got 10, but yeah, we're trying to blow it up. So awesome. Well, congratulations on the baby. Thank you. Um, and thank you for joining us. I'm just going to get us out of here. All right, everyone, that was an amazing interview. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. And I just really want to thank everyone, the outpouring of generosity um, so far on the first day of our annual appeal to Seeds of Hope has been uh, amazing. We are truly grateful for the support. We couldn't have come this far without you. And we need your support and your generosity to keep assisting people all across this country. Especially right now with COVID, the need is even great, greater. People are struggling. Um, so thank you from the bottom of my heart um, for that generosity. And we will continue to fight um, to help people gain sobriety. And so thank you. God bless. Be safe.